This is a special edition of what we into. We oh are... well, I, don't make it a special. Just I feel like we should just make this like a. It should be a normal thing. Like we right. didn't do anything uh, untoward. We You're just right. had. Because I mean, when when, when we had a uh, um, uh, Costi on the on, right, we, we didn't make it a thing. Okay, okay. You know what I'm saying? Let's... This is not special at all. Not special at all. This, this is not. It's just this a normal is just day. Week fifty one. Week fifty one. Week fifty one. We just... We might do. We actually could do like a whole specific episode just for this since. I have a feeling we're going to go longer than expected. You think so? I, I, I actually, I feel, I feel like I, it's going to be just as succinct. Because it's 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 like, <laughs> it's about to be 12.30 now, which is normally about the time we start. Sure. Um, so, I mean, if we go about our, our normal kind of modus operandi, it won't we'll go that long. Who, who are we about to call here? Uh, we're about to call a good, well, it, technically he is the brother of a really good friend of mine. Uh, his, uh, his name is Dave. I don't know what the W stands for. His name is Dave Khan. Dave Ward. Is it Ward? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the name of, I mean, the, name of the main character? Na- yeah. Okay, well then, uh, uh, Dave Can. Uh, he's a he's a brother of a really good friend of mine, Chris Can. Um, What's he created? Well, he created uh, this this group of well well this uh, uh, series of books. One. Uh, one book is called uh, Lovecraft P.I., uh, Paranormal Investigator, which is dope. Yep. And then the other book is called Berserkers. And these are um, serial uh, comics that he has written uh, and gotten. Uh, basically, he's the editor-in-chief of his own uh, comic book company, Dark Side Media, which, I mean, Can that's, I... that's right in our fucking wheelhouse. Yeah, right. For sure. Can I also just say it took me about two days to realize that Lovecraft P.I., did not stand for pri- well, it's, it private. Stand, it's private investigator, but also paranormal, paranormal investigator. Yeah, because I'm, I'm a big dummy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, reading is fundamental, Lawrence. Yes. I, I don't know if you you know this about that, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, we're, we're gonna you know get Dave on the line and then wrap him a little bit about uh, these books he wrote um, that I think we both kind of enjoyed over the course of uh, our, our time with. Yeah. So this is not a special episode at not all. At all. Not we're at not interviewing anybody regular, special. We're regular, regular people here. 50, 50, Normal dudes. 51, just hanging out, <laughs> you know, not showing our nutsack to random people. Let's give this to a call. <laughs> <laughs> Dave. Hey, man. How you doing? Hey, not too bad, brother. I'm uh, sitting here with my co-host, Larry. Larry, this is uh, my hey buddy Dave. Hey, Dave. How you doing, man? Hey, man. How you guys doing? Not doing too good. bad, man. Uh, so, uh, how you doing, man? Long time. I haven't seen you in a bit, my dude. No, I know. I know. Christmas, uh, I didn't know you guys, I didn't know you actually had a podcast either. When Chris mentioned uh, he was just out in New York and saw you, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, man. So, how long have you guys been doing this? Uh, this, will, this will be our 51st week at it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, we started. At, we started, I think, in uh, November or December of last year, and we've tried to go. Um, well, we put out content. I, I think pretty much every week, um, every week since then. Yeah, we skip a few weeks. Yeah, you know? I mean Thanksgiving, holidays, and stuff like that. But sure. for the most part, it's been uh, a consistent burn since last year. That's great, man. That's yeah. Great. And you guys are liking it and everything. I mean, it, we, we keep doing it, so <laughs> it's I feel fine. like it's just an excuse for us to get together and talk shit. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I think you might have got, gave, given a listen to the podcast, so you kind of know what, what our bent is. And uh, I got to say, for the mo- I loved your book, man. Thanks, man. Thank you. Same here. It was fantastic. Like, so, like, uh, is it cool if we just jump in and start asking you some questions about it or whatnot? Yeah, sure. Whenever you guys are ready. I want to know, uh, so, I want to know the, sort of the evolution from the first comic, Shot in the Dark, to the reanimator, Curious Case of the Reanimator. Uh, how did you get started with this? What got you into the comic scene and the writing in general? Um, I have been writing for a long time, um, and uh, you know, ever, basically ever since high school, on and off. And it wasn't until I moved out to LA that I actually started writing screenplays for folks. Um, a lot of the stuff was just like low budget, you know. But um, it was, you know, get my teeth cut out on that stuff. So um, that was a lot of fun. I watched um I watched a preview on some of your YouTube uh, channels for the uh, was Terminal Interlude the Urban Spelunking. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> you, you you started laughing. <laughs> what 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 what's funny? No, it's just uh, that, that, you know that particular picture was a, uh, a, a, a it was fun to shoot, but it was a kind of a monumental nightmare. I had seven days to shoot it. <laughs> uh, I only had uh, basically I came on to replace a director who had quit. 
and the uh, producer had given me the script, but the script had no name on it. Uh huh. I didn't know. Who, I didn't know who had written it. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was reading the script, and literally, it'd be like a couple of pages of dialogue. Then you turn, and it'd say, um, you know, whatever the character's name was. They run down the hallway, make a left, <laughs> turn the page. They run down the other hallway, make a right. That's literally all it said on the page. <laughs> one description, and I'm like. You know, and I've been written writing script. I've worked in a lot of movies over the years, and I was like, wait a second, this is never going to match up to a 90-minute picture. It's going to be 15 minutes at best. So um, the producer was the, actually the one who had written it, and I called up and I had said to him, I was like, dude, I don't know who wrote this, but I'd get my money back. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, well, I wrote it. And I was like, oh. I said, well, it's still terrible. And I said, well, I said, if you want me to direct this picture, I've got to rewrite the script. And I said, because, you know, I can't work with something that's just so, you know, basically blank yeah. and, um, you know so it worked out actually fine it took me about two weeks um i basically rewrote the whole thing and the actors loved it because they actually had something to do now you know <laughs> before when they had gotten the script they're like they had no clue like you know any of their characters and you know what they were supposed to be a part of and so on and so forth so you know which is what you're supposed to put in the script you know, for people to understand you know right um <laughs> Yeah, so it, that was a lot of fun. But then he, uh, yeah, it was just, it was a nightmare. And, and eventually what ended up happening is the picture got made, we got it done, um, and then that guy ended up going to jail for embezzling money to make the movie. So. Sweet. Ah! <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, 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 so that, is, that, is that how you kind of navigated your way into comics? You were like, I, I'll stay out of jail if I, do, if I, uh, if I just do right. comic books instead well, of the films. Well, it's funny. Well, the way Lovecraft came up was about was back in 2010. I was working on another picture, uh, directing and, and producing an animated kids film, which, <laughs> for its own reasons, never saw the light of day. And um, during that time, um, the the co writer on there, um, Fritz and myself, uh, it was around the time uh, that that HP had just become into public domain, mm. and um, <clears throat> we were like, you know, we're we're, we're we're getting the shit kicking, you know, kicking and, and going, you know, we wanted to write scripts that we could just make much, just sell and make money on, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, so we were like, Oh, you know, Lovecraft just came out, you know, public domain. Well, why don't we just do something like Lovecraft PI, you know, create, you know, take his work, you know, and, and like everything he's created, but put, you know, create an actual detective character and, you know, put him in the world. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so so we decided to go with that, and we wanted to do create our own character, Ward Lovecraft, so that you know he's his own. He's basically he's virtually you know the polar opposite of everything HP was. You mm-hmm. know, as an author, you know he was you know our character wasn't afraid to go outside. Our character has you know his own issues on certain things, but he's not. You know, we, we just didn't want him to be the author <laughs> turned detective. You what, know, because. What? There's a lot of that type of stuff out there, right? And a lot of people seem to take the author himself and put him in situations. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. I try to be a purist in that sense. It's like I'd rather use his his work, his writing, and his personal uh, portions of his personal life uh-huh. to create a character, you know, that wasn't such, you know, well, it's, th- that didn't have his past. Well, it's it's interesting that you that you that you bring it because I I feel like I knew about H.P. Lovecraft's world based on like Cthulhu and some of that other stuff. But I didn't really know who he was, like the author, his politics, and, and any of that until until this until reading your book actually, right. because um, subsequently uh, in the same week that that, that uh, your brother dropped uh, your books at my door, there was this article that came out on Kotaku about uh, this the creators of this new Cthulhu game who basically they were acknowledging that Lovecraft had this kind of like sordid past, and I was like, wait, what? And uh, and then through that that little bit of investigation, I was able to be like, oh wow, this guy had this really kind of colorful. And then and and it, it came up right at the same time that I was reading your books. So I was like, I wonder, I wonder how did how did Dave manage this? Did he know this? Probably. Um, what was that like? So I mean, can you talk a little bit about that sort of thing? Like, yeah. So you know, um, it's funny because you know I got I got into Lovecraft back in um, <clears throat> high school, and then. Didn't really get you know into him much more than that until college. I read some more stuff, and then kind of you know, I mean, I read stories over the years, but kind of just fell off my map until we started working on this project in 2010. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really know much about his personal life either. I mean, I had read some things, but other than just reading his work, I you know, yeah, it doesn't matter to me, you know, right? It, 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 because it's weird; it doesn't really appear in the work so much, or at least, no, no, at least no. the, I mean, the... unless you start digging and and, and, and like. You know, associate like you know his personal life with the writing. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, okay, I can kind of see that. Uh-huh. 
you know, you got to kind of dig for it. Otherwise, if you're just a casual reader, you right. won't necessarily get it. And I, and I think that's um, that's that's kind of where the, the the standpoint that I think both me and uh, and Larry were, were approaching this work was like, wow. I mean, I know of this world and sort of this mythos, but I didn't know sort of the interpersonal connections that you know the author had with that same mythos. You know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And and I mean, yes, he had a colorful life, but uh, you know. Uh, no more than most of us, I don't think. And um, I, I and I do extensive. You know, it's funny because once once my co writer was working on Shot in the Dark, I kind of let him. That was his story that he wanted to do. Uh-huh. And, you know, because Innsmouth, Innsmouth, you know, is, is a pretty well known. Shadows of Innsmouth is a pretty well known story of his, uh-huh. and it's one of his favorites. So, um, so you know, my writer on that one, he wanted to take that and and, and um, you know, kind of combine that with uh, Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest. Right. So we took those kind of stories and kind of matched them together and um, created what you read. And so we threw a little bit of that stuff in there. But to go back also to your original question and to also answer you here, <clears throat> after that after that book was done, which took us quite a long time and, and, and a lot of, we had a lot of problems on it, but we finally had gotten it finished. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I really want to go into his, like, you know, I want to bring more of his personal life into uh, our character Ward, but in doing that, I want my character to, you know, make better decisions, Mm -hmm. you know, do different things, you know. Um, You know, for instance, HP, you know, his parents, his his dad died when he was five, more or less, you know, in an asylum, uh, died of syphilis, and his mom ended up dying when he was uh, 19 or 20. Um, she went insane and, and nuts. And so he had a, a tough upbringing to begin with. Um, and so what I want to do is have all that stuff in there, but just the outcome would be different. Right. You right. You know what I mean? Right. So, it, you know, so my character's not stuck inside, you know, having, you know, he's a little, he's not allergic to the cold. He doesn't have, you know, he's, he's not infirm. He's not, inf- he's not infirmed the way that the author was. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the other thing, too, is HP had wanted to go into, he wanted to serve his country and go into World War One. His mom basically said no, and he, he kind of had to fudge his way to get out of it. Um, and so, like, my character does that, you know. So he goes, this, you know, he ended up going to, war, you know, to serve in World War One. Um, but, you know, uh, my character was also a doctor, or HP wanted to be, wanted to be that, but was more of a chemist and, you know, was into astrology. So I do take a lot of those things and... and I spent a lot of time, there's a, a library in Providence, which is amazing, called the John Hay Library, which is actually, uh, HP's, I think it was his second house, I might be wrong, but his second house was actually built right behind there, which is no longer ex- in existence. Um, so they have all his work they've been collecting there since before he died, and then after he had passed away, his aunt basically, and uh, Derelith had, uh, Derelith had um, given a lot of stuff to, as well as other people had given a lot of stuff to that library. So they've got almost 40 boxes full of uh, letters that he either received or wrote and wow. manuscripts, all sorts of stuff. So I've been, they have it online too, but um, because I spend a lot of time on my computer, I'd like to actually go to Providence and, and hang out there, uh-huh. you know, um, walk the neighborhood as well as like, you know, spend some time in the library going through this stuff. So I find an amazing amount of information that just nobody knows. Mm. You know, I mean, unless, unless you spend the time to do that research, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, certain letters that I've read between his wife, uh, HPL's wife, and after he passed away to Daryl, <laughs> who was a close friend of HP's. So there's a lot of like little just stuff in there. And what I found was reading the letters that either uh, HP wrote, which originally, supposedly he wrote about 700,000 letters in his lifetime. Because wow. of letters and postcards. Okay. Jesus. Far more than he ever wrote just in his own manuscript. So, um, and honestly, his letters are insane. I mean, they're like 20, sometimes 20, 25 pages, double sides, um, all cursive, um, or sometimes typed, but he wasn't a big, he didn't like typewriters, so he wrote everything longhand. And sometimes oh, his letters go for the, over the course of a week. Like, he'll be, um, you know, in spending time in New York with his, with his wife, and then he'll be writing his aunts, uh, who he was living with back in Providence every once in a while. And he, so he'd write these, like, day-to-day stuff. And to me, that's just like, that's like the, the really cool stuff because you learn about him with that, you know, he, he's just being unabashed. And you're also learning about the time period. This is like 19, 19, 19, 19, 20, 21, somewhere around there, mm-hmm. maybe 25. So you, you get to learn about like the cost of things in New York. Like he was complaining about having to pay for a flat in New York for a week, which I think the most expensive flat was like 15 bucks for the week. He got, which I thought was hysterical. So you guys live in New York, so it's just like, right. Oh, man. <laughs> 
I wish. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd kill someone to do that. Like, I would, I, I would literally, want, I'm like, if someone was like, hey, I'll let you live here for $15 a week if you'd go over there and just stab that guy repeatedly. I'm like, give me the knife. And fight, look for look for the cops. It's done. <laughs> so he complained about that, but then by the end of the letter, he found this sweet old lady, or he wrote a postcard, I think, after the letter was sent, or a postcard saying, I found this sweet little old lady that was, you know, room in a house, uh, had a room in a house for eight bucks a week. So he was all <laughs> excited about that. So he, you know, and the thing I do love about him as, as, as an author, um, in his creations is that he was very giving to other people, other authors, you know, and, and that's what I like to do too, is I stay within his, the confines of his, um, his core group of friends. And, you know, he always loved when people would expand upon his Cthulhu mythos, mm. you know, so I think, Oh, interesting. You know, I think, yeah, no, and he had no problem with this. So I think, and he also, he also actually, um, did a lot of, uh, 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 editing and, and, and ghostwriting for people too that he never took credit for. Okay, huh. and you know, and a lot of times, I mean, when you look at the cost of the stuff, I mean, you're talking, you know, a several page manuscript you do for like a buck twenty five a page or something, or even less. I mean, it was in, in insanely cheap. And I know we're talking about he the could, 20s and he could friends, stay in an apartment still. for a whole day for that much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. like it's like you six know. hours of living in an apartment <laughs> in New York. Right, you're done. You pay, you pay so Dave, so. I mean, I, I gotta ask. I mean, it, how do you start your own? Because you have Dark Media is your own comic book company, right? Yes, yes. I mean, that, that, I mean, that's how do you? How does one go about m- breaking into an industry like the comic book industry based on like these mono? Like we have these monolithic companies. You know, you got the Marvels, you got the DCs, you got the Dark Horses. How does one decide? You know what? I'm gonna kick my my hat into the ring. I'm I'm gonna go full bore and 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 do this. Right. Um, well, you know, going back to 2010 when we had written this as a screenplay, we wrote Lovecraft: uh, Shot in the Dark as a screenplay first. Ah. Um, and we had shot that around for about two years, and nobody wanted it, which we thought was kind of crazy because even if they didn't like the script necessarily, the idea alone was enough to. Well, that's yeah, it, that's it interesting. Was fresh. Well, that's okay. that's interesting because I I've noticed in recent times this sort of like proliferation of Lovecraftian um, uh, IPs. Uh, oh, like yeah, yeah. there was a it was a video game that we talked about on the podcast. Like I don't know, maybe a couple of months back, where the whole the, it was it's called, I think it's called the S- Sunken City or the Sinking City. Sinking yeah, City. Yeah, Sunken City. I, I talked to a lot of fans about that. They love it because it's it's yeah. really down dialed into Lovecraft's world. And, and very much in the way that like you you know how like in in a, I think it's in the Curious Case of the Reanimator how you have like these the animal hybrid kind of world where like uh you know animals and and humans kind of co- cohabitate with each other and things like that. Like the right. Sinking City is 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 rife with that. There's you know there's there's characters that like ha- are full on like walrus people and, and things like this. So uh, it, it just it was just interesting to me that like an idea like like this script that you were shopping around for two years at the top when uh you know when uh his uh when when uh Lovecraft's uh, stuff got uh what's the word I'm looking for um well, yeah just public domain pu- yeah, yeah public domain once that guy hits public domain it, like if it it it's almost feels like a no brainer that like right. it, like somebody would have just taken this world and like gone full bore with it. Well, yeah, no, that's what we, we were completely dumbfounded by it. And, and, and what was even stranger is at the time that this was going on, I don't know if you guys knew this, but it was in the trades. But Cameron, James Cameron, and, and also Guillermo del Toro were working on doing the uh, In the Mountains of Madness. Together. Right. I, I think I there was, yeah, I think I, there was a bit of a rumor mill about this. Yeah. I and think, I think, I, yeah, so. I think del Toro's, because del Toro's Hellboy is also, they were kind of like hit or miss. They weren't like huge box office draws. And it's also why he never really got the third movie made the way that he wanted to. So right. that that could have also been out there because there was that Lovecraft kind of influence over his work, and so they might have been right. kind of trying to step back from that, right? Because of the the not success of like the, the right. sequels or whatever. Yeah, maybe. But I mean, what, what happened? My understanding of what happened with that particular project with them is that it was over a two hundred million dollar budget. Mm-hmm. Wow! The studio was like, "We're not going to put that into a horror movie." Wow! Right, you know? right. right. Which to me is insane because right. if you got those two good juggernauts of, of talent behind it. You know, it's a uh, no-brainer. James Cameron has proved us wrong time and time again with both Titanic and Avatar, which personally I thought they were going to tank, and <laughs> no pun intended. And and, and uh, they both, you know, yeah, like, like, <laughs> right, yeah. So I mean, you never know with this stuff, but 
Yeah, so for, for us, so what ended up happening was um, I shopped it around. Nobody was interested. So I decided um, in 2013, we uh, came up with some artwork and went to the um, New York Comic Con. Oh, no shit. And, what what, what year? Ridiculous amount of money there for, for no reason. <laughs> just to get in. The, basically, we had a... We had a table just to kind of promote ourselves to get us out there, and we ran a Kickstarter campaign. So you, you guys were on Artist Alley that year? No, they put us, we did it last minute, so they put us in the vendor, uh, oh. in the vendor's room. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it was it was pretty bananas, and the only good thing that came out of that, though, was um, Diamond actually found us, and they offered us, um, you know, a deal once we get the book done. Um, but the, problem, the book ended up taking far longer than it should have, and then Diamond changed their contract, and I was, it just, it's not... Diamond's not meant for guys like me, unfortunately, mm. because it's just too much money um, that I have to give out, and I, I don't see the return right. um, until after they do. So, mm. uh, you know, which is understandable. So, to answer your question, the once we started working into the comic aspect of it, I just changed my company to uh, Dark Side Media, and I felt well, since everybody seems to be taking comic books and turning them into it, <clears throat> excuse me, turning them into movies. Uh-huh. Why don't we just do that? Why don't we just take our comic book? And then it's automatically a, uh, basically a um, storyboard. Right, um, right. And, and then we'll just go back to the studio because in that way they can look at the pretty pictures. They can t- you get the it's, essence of the story. It's, it's basically like a, a proof of concept that you can put into someone's hand. Yeah, just so, you know, exactly. Because the problem with screenplays is, you know, it's you have to leave it up to the person's imagination. Sure. Um, depending on how well the screenplay is written to and how much information is actually given, you, you do have a lot to uh, kind of figure out in your own head. and. You know, with Lovecraft's world, and you guys read, you know, both those books, particularly with Reanimator. You know, giving somebody a script like that and just going, hey, you know, yeah, there's a giant just, spider lady. Just giant do spider the script. <laughs> just do the script. It worked for Sin City. It worked for Three Hundred. Just do the script. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> hey, hey, Dave, can you can you tell me about your writing process between the two? Uh, a shot in the dark versus the Curious Case of Reanimator, because they're both very different types of stories. The first one, A Shot in the Dark, feels more kind of like a detective kind of noir, where uh, Curious Case of Reanimator feels a little more like a detective adventure story. Mm. Sure, sure. Yeah, so the, so um, Shot in the Dark takes place in 1937, because we wanted to have the first one take place the day that H.P. Lovecraft, the author, had passed away. Huh. So, and he died March, uh, March 15th, 1937, so that's when the first story takes Interesting. place. Interesting. Oh, okay. Okay. Like, okay. Didn't yeah, know. there's just a weird little thing that we threw in there. So then, it's cool. Um, what we decided to do was that again um my my co-writer on that pre- pre- predominantly wrote that you know that story as just a straight detective story and then when i went, went back to do the reanimator i wanted i wanted to do call of cthulhu mm-hmm. and i wanted reanimator to be in it and the thing is with call of cthulhu you, i don't know if you guys have read the read that story but mm-hmm. um it's very epic you mm-hmm. know, in its scope. Um, and so I just had to figure out which way I was going to start telling it first because, like, the, the beginning of that story is the Wilcox where it's this, it's this kind of raw, uh, artist that's seeing, you know, dreams and then he goes and sees the professor and then goes on from there. I was like, yeah, all right, well, that's been done. Everybody's kind of done that. Mm-hmm. So I said, I, I figured the best part for me was to go, excuse me, and do the New Orleans uh, version, excuse me, out of the story that has John LaGrasse, the, the inspector in there because to me, that part of the story was really cool. There's a lot of great stuff in it, but they don't really tell. He doesn't really tell you a lot, so I, there's a lot for me to expand upon. Uh-huh. And the one thing that caught me is in the original story, it says these two giant black furry things at the feet of the person who's, uh, you know, at the monolith. And I was like, oh, well, that, that's going to be Herbert West. He's created these things, and right. it's like then the story just kind of wrote itself out uh-huh. after that point. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I go about that: is I basically take. Um, I read, I, you know, I read obviously both stories and broke them down tremendously so that I can have each section kind of collate with Call of Cthulhu in with Reanimator. So I pick bits and pieces from the original Reanimator story and throw it in there so that you get the best of both worlds. And then, um, you know, and then to build upon that, what I do is I watch a lot of noir films, a lot of films from the twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, read a lot of uh, Dashiell Hammett. I read a lot of uh, H.P. Lovecraft's work as well as listening to it. Um, and then I do a lot of um, personal research into, into Lovecraft's life, you know. So I've got a, a ton of books uh, of his personal life and all his letters and so on and so forth. So it's basically just reading that, listening to that, and then just, um, you know, uh, you know, 
sit here in front of the computer and just kind of hashing it all out and almost a stream of consciousness is kind of how I wrote this one. So can you can you speak a little bit to like how long each book took or takes sure. in the process? Because um, you, you mentioned that there were problems in, in, in the writing of the first book. Um, and and also, I actually, I think this is a great point. To, I, I wanted to give a shout out to whoever is, is drawing your books. I think the, the guy's name is Daniel. I, I, I'm going to murder his last name. Skigulia, yeah. yeah. Skigulia. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's it, fine. Yeah, he, no, Daniel's amazing. He's been with me for about four years. Four years going on five years now. And he actually started working with me drawing our berserkers our, our second title the, the other title which i really enjoyed um uh, i i personally thought that the berserker and you are you guys are still writing the berserker is that is that still continuing yeah berserkers were on actually i just literally right before you guys called me i got uh new color pages uh, from damien my colorist uh he's working on book seven right now i'm um, sorry he's working on book six daniel's working on book seven and i've got to finish writing book eight and then that's it we're, we'll be done awesome wow. that's awesome <laughs> So yeah, I'm sorry. I, I interrupted you. Were you were telling uh, like from time frame to time frame, like start to sure. finish for like a particular uh, book or story. Well, yeah, sure. So so when we first started doing the comics, um, I, I you know I was a filmmaker uh, to begin with. So and I and I'd done storyboards and stuff like that, but I'd never made a comic in my life. I mean, I've read them, but I never made one. And I'd say it's probably as equally as difficult as making a film. Um, I don't know if it's more or less, but man, it, it was it was brutal. <laughs> and a lot of it was because of, you know, you have to make the right hires because these books take forever. Uh-huh. Um, and we had decided to do this, the Shot in the Dark originally as a, a three can, floppies. Can, can we were going to put it up on Kickstarter and do it that way. Um, and, you know, we went through a couple of artists on the first book. Uh, we had one artist that had gotten about halfway through. He turned in some work that wasn't great. And I asked him if he could, wouldn't mind just redoing that. And then he, um, he had a nutty. And, uh, wait, you know, I know wait, did you, did you, did you, wait, 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 did you say he, he had a nutty? A nutty, man, he went, he went ballistic on Okay, it, okay, know? cause okay. Like, you like, we, we have a, uh, some older listeners that sometimes <laughs> listen to our podcast, so sometimes yeah. you gotta break some shit down for them, like. Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so did he. I thought a nutty was old, man. Dude, that's, that's years, man. I'm old he, guy. he had a nutty, huh? He had a nutty. <laughs> so this was this was the artist of the first couple of comics in a shot in the dark, and that's why the art style changes in the last two, I believe. No, so what happened was, so that guy he was doing the first book, right? You know, issue one, he got halfway through. Uh, uh, d- instead of actually doing the page, he just went nuts, and, and it's like you know. So I was like, okay, you're done. I can't, I can't keep right. working on another two and a half issues with you. You're gonna just lose your mind every time. <laughs> yes. So, uh, <laughs> You know, it just doesn't, I mean, you know, I'm an artist, dude, I get it, you know, it's, you don't want to have to redo your work, but when it comes in complete garbage, it's like, you know, I'm not, it's not acceptable, and I'm paying, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so anyway, he flipped, and so, uh, and at this point, he had already been the second artist I had on board, so um, I went to a third artist, uh, who was Antonio, and so he wrote, he did the first two books, which we did, and then um, my co-author had decided to, he, he didn't like the pace, because what was happening is these books were taking phenomenally long like you know years yeah and so wow. Um, wow. by okay. the end of the second book my, my co-author was he was wigging out about that so he was like well I'll draw I'm like okay he'll draw the third book okay fine we'll see if that happens um it took him nine months <laughs> he only he only did four pages <laughs> and yeah so that was a nightmare <laughs> um, and so, so basically I had to cut that off and then I, I said I brought Daniel over and I said Daniel because he was solid man this guy just he only works for me and he just cranked the stuff out so yeah. I was like Daniel I, I know the style's different I'm not asking you to match it and at least at the beginning of the third book where Lovecraft wakes up and he's you know because he's strapped to the table to, yeah right it kind of makes a little sense there so I was like okay fine <laughs> you know and, and then, so then by the time we got to the second book I was like I cut all the dead meat away and I had my core group of guys mm-hmm. And um, and that's how we just moved on for for that. So the first book, first uh, Lovecraft, Shot in the Dark, the entire the entire three issues took us four years. Wow. Yeah. yeah and, and wow. I don't want to know how much money. Um, <laughs> wow. So I mean, th- th- there had to be a point where you were like, "I'm doing this for the love of this art," because that that, that that's insane to me. Like four years to do like three books, and and granted, they're really good. 
But but like I, I I mean just the amount of like you just said the money and the time like there had to be a point where you were like I'm doing this because I I love this work and like can you speak any at all to that or, or maybe it wasn't like that maybe you were like you know what whatever it takes also what I, I want to know what yeah, your right. your your side job was as well during through all this <laughs> right like, what right is, yeah what is paying the bills yeah, here well, while yeah. while you're setting this up <laughs> yeah exactly oh yeah yeah so uh, you know because well to answer your first question so it, it's I mean, back in 2010, we knew we had a hit. Mm. I mean, we just had, like, I mean, you know, there's a there's a film, uh, an HBO movie that came out back in 1990, I think it was, with Fred Ward called Cast a Deadly Spell, which I had never seen. Huh. And it's, just, it's this early, and I think David Warner's in it, and there's this early, like, Lovecraftian-esque movie where uh, Fred Ward is the detective. Um, I love that so actor, lot, too. You know, so... People had mentioned this to me, and I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And, I, and I, so I had caught, I didn't watch, the, I've never watched the whole thing, but I've caught bits and pieces. I was like, oh, okay. So again, it's like everybody's familiar with a detective story. Yeah. But when you have a detective fighting monsters, it's great. But then when you throw him into the 1920s or 30s, he, you know, he doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have a, you know, yeah, a it's... gun. So he's got to, like, he's got to go more on his facial stuff. You know, so for me, it was one of those things where I think it would, um, you know, it was the love of that. I, mm-hmm. I love I love mysteries. I love detective novels. I love same. all that stuff. I'm, I'm the same. I'm so for me, it's it's a great idea. Mm-hmm. And man, I've been in this business a long, for over thirty years, uh, working the film. So I've seen everything you can come up with, pretty much. Uh-huh. I thought that this was like, you know, because I I'm sure you guys like Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Like yeah, of course, Jones. of course. You like you like James Bond, of course. It's like we don't have any of those anymore. It's like we have the retread of exactly the right, ones, right, you know, right. And it's like to me. All these, all these franchises, have, you know, uh, and I don't want to go into Star Wars, but all these franchises have <laughs> been blessed beyond belief, and not to a good sense. And right. So I figured, well, I would like to get this out there, you know, hopefully not molested, <laughs> you know, can actually be seen by people, and fans dig it. And, and honestly, man, the fans, and that's the other thing, too, honestly, the fans fucking love it. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Every show I go to, I get the... They seem because I see you see the covers that we do, right? Yeah, honest, they're, they're epic. Like I mean, Shipper. they're epic. And um, I blow those up into giant, uh, you know, freestanding banners. So when people walk by, they're like, "Holy shit, what is this?" And yeah. I, and so, you know, when I start reading the book, I'm like, "This is a great idea. Why yeah. doesn't anybody pick this up?" That's that's the, the, the biggest conversation I have with people, at least ninety percent of the time. You know, is this is awesome? I want to see this. I right. Want this is a video game. I right. Want this is a movie. Right. right. An animated film. I mean, they want it. <laughs> Because they see something in it, which is awesome. And and for me, I'm a big fan of nostalgia and old movies and shit like that. So I love throwing that stuff in there because we all have that lizard brain in the back of our head that you know if something sticks that you remember from your childhood, you're like, ooh, that feels good. Yes. I like that. You know, um, and then you'll go and watch it. So it's like that to me is like with, with, with for Reiterator particularly, I was a huge fan of The Invisible Man. Love the 1932 movie. Yep. Love the book. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's like I'll never get to make the universal version of that. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, why couldn't the reanimator make himself invisible? Shit, he could do anything. He could reanimate the dead. You know, why not come up with some type of weird solution to do that? Yeah, great you idea. Know? So, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I was just saying that's a great idea. And, you know, Universal's been trying to, like, kickstart their dark universe now for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And they've, exactly. they've been able, they're about to come out with a new Invisible Man movie. Yeah, I saw, I saw the preview for it. Uh Oh, so they, oh, yeah, because isn't Johnny Depp or somebody going to be in? No, it's, I, I I recently saw it, and I think they're, what are they, they're calling it something different. Is it the Invisible Man? I think it's Invisible Man, yeah, Invisible Man. Because Kevin Bacon, Kevin Bacon did, did, did one uh, a couple of years yeah, back, the hol- yeah, the hol- Hollow Man, right. um, but I think, yeah, the Invisible Man, yeah. Yeah, because they did the, um, I didn't see the Mummy movie, the uh, Tom Cruise thing, I didn't watch it was, that. It was, but, it's um, bad, it's terrible. It was bad, you, you, yeah, it was a, a, a dumpster yeah, fire. Me, it's like the, those those stories are so cool and they're so iconic and they're you know and it really kind of reaches into that kind of uh, gothic core yeah of fandom and it's like for these guys to, to have take something so easy and screw it up like that it just kind of baffles me. So, yeah, yeah. You know? No, you're so you're, you're, you're right. preaching to the choir here, homie. You're preaching to the choir over here. We we we, <laughs> sure. we like uh, it was. It, I, I, I almost wanted to, to broach the subject of Star Wars with you because I know <laughs> from talking to your brother how you feel about it. Uh, we're all on board, and I, and, and I, we don't just, we don't have enough time, Dave. Dave, we'd have to we'd have to have you call in next week just to broach the subject. We can get you on the show again. It's <laughs> you know not really. I know the guy I, who, who runs this thing. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick little thing that you know. 
that show. I haven't seen the new one, and I, I don't, I'm not going to. Don't, um, don't, don't do it. Last one, don't do it. The last one uh, sent me back. But, so a buddy of mine, who, uh, him and I grew up together. Uh, we've known, known each other since we were five years old. So we went to Star Wars together when we were eight years old, you know, and right. into the theater. So, you know, to see, the, you know, kind of where it's gone, and as I was telling you before about how these things get kind of, you know, screwed up over the years, he, uh, he, he, <laughs> He finally sat down to watch the new movie last night. Oh. <laughs> he was texting me, calling me. It was like, it was, it was like, it was like an ex-girlfriend like, going over like all the you know, trials and tribulations of a, of the a trauma. Hey, like, going over the trauma of the relationship. Yes. <laughs> Being a Star Wars fan isn't like it's like being yeah. in an abusive yeah. relationship. Being, yeah, especially nowadays. But yeah, it's like being in an abusive. Well, maybe I can change him. I, I can <laughs> right. change him if I write enough and and, and, and get and blog what, enough. What and... he really meant was, <laughs> what they really mean is this. They don't mean that. No. We don't live in the men of black world. We can have a mind wipe. So. You know, short of going and get a you know electroshock therapy, uh, you know we're going to remember this crap. It's just, that's, that's the problem is you can try to fix it all you want, but you know how many Jason Friday the Thirteenth movies are there? Right. <laughs> you know, I I, I, mean, I, 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 mean, you know, I lost count. At some point, so that's the thing with this stuff is like with Lovecraft, I wanted to kind of introduce something new, and and um, uh, the job I have is I, I caretake for somebody, so it's it's one of those things where I'm, I'm set up in a certain situation that is allowing me to do this. Right. Which, if it was the jobs that I've had prior to this, there's no way in hell I'd be able to do both. It's, right. it's impossible. Right, right. Um, but, um, you know, but it's a lot of work. I mean, you know, putting these books together, uh, Reanimated took us, it was only supposed to take us a year. I think it took us a year and like four months. It's right. still pretty good though, I mean, man. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, for, for, I mean, I think in, in, in any aspect of, yeah. of like creation, especially when you're talking about art, there is a little time, like the way like video games always kind of get pushed back. Like they they need a couple more months to sort of like sew things up. I think that's that's usually the case with art as well, especially art like this. So I mean, I I, I think we both. I don't want to speak too much. I don't want to speak uh, for Larry, but I'm gonna speak for myself. I I think we I love these these books. Uh, I I think I'm gonna continue, especially with Berserker. Berserker was a really nice sort of uh, jump forward, especially with time and. And sort of the thematic uh, uh, um, shift that 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 property takes, like the whole aspect of like this this play kind of t- like the zombie, like a, a play on the zombie kind of thing. Uh, not on like a, like a, like a, a more recent Resident Evil video game and things like that. It all, all that all that to say, I think you're doing a really good job and keep keep uh, keep keep going, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, Berserkers is funny because that that actually was a screenplay. Um, Bill uh, Hawk and I wrote um, back in 1997, 98. Wow. And, um, wow. That, all, that actually <laughs> took place in modern time. Um, but then what happened was uh, 28 Days Later came out. And we're uh, like, God damn it. <laughs> so wow. We had to go yeah. back and, and yeah. we, we changed it all to the 1950s. And then um, we created it on this island, uh, which is called No Man's Land. Uh, I mean, it's called Soul Island in the book. But there's an island where I, off the coast of where I live, that's called No Man's Land. That's completely uninhabited, and it's owned by the government. Oh, and no they shit. Used to, um, they used to use it as a bombing range. No shit. And, uh, yeah. So up until the 18, uh, 1988, 1989. Um, like, like one of the uh, those uh, Elizabethan joints uh, off off the coast over there. It's on the other side. It's it's like uh, you know, where Gay Head is up yeah. there. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the the, the Elizabeth and uh, Islands are on the right, and then No Man's Land's kind of out by itself. Like, oh. if, you're, if you're at the beach there, you can look out and see it. And it was weird, so growing up as a kid, you'd hear these, you'd see, the, see it and hear it, you know, all the time over there. So, um, coming up with this idea, we just thought, why not make a, a um, like a virus outbreak that happens within a 24 hour period on an island during a hurricane mm. in the 1950s? Mm-hmm. And it's like, what the hell would you have, what, what could you possibly have to do, or what could you? How could you get through it yeah. in 24 hours? That, uh, you know, so that's that's the thing that's been really fun, but also really difficult trying to bring all these characters in and right. make everything kind of happen. You know, it's but good, it's man. Been, I I had a lot I had a lot of fun with Berserker. I had a lot of fun thanks, with it. Um, and, and, with, um, and with Reanimator, what we're doing next is uh, so we have Reanimator that's done, and um, the next story is the Wilcox experiment. So I'm still c- following in the Call of Cthulhu, and that takes place about four years after this story. Uh-huh. Um, okay. Um, because you know, you you mentioned Indiana Jones and how that sort of jumps around in the timeline. 
of things. Yeah. And that's sort of what these sort of these stories kind of remind me of. It, these are just adventures of Lovecraft, and they take place in these sort of separate time periods. And they can jump forward in time, they can jump backward in time. And so this next one, the the Wilcox experiment you're telling us, is going to jump four years in, into the future. Right. But so then what happens is, and then the, and then the um, fourth volume is 20,000 Fathoms to Arie, and that is, um, that actually... Because both Wilcox and that book take place um, right next to each other in the timeline, they'll uh, well, it'll take us a little, you know, some time to put this the, that book out. Mm-hmm. But the idea is that um, they'll take place in the course of oh, the entire story takes place in about a month in between those two books. Okay. okay. So um, just because of the way I'm trying to set up the Call of Cthulhu and, and, and how all the calling works and so on and so forth, the story purposes, but I try to make them so that can pick them up and not be totally lost you can see what's going on and i also try to give enough information in there so that you know i'm sure you guys figured you know at the end of reanimator there he's talking about carter right um you know who's a character out of the lovecraft mythos um who deals with dreams Mm -hmm. so he's kind of our dream warrior um and the next book i'm getting the next book actually has he's he's globe trotting globe trotting around to um four or five different countries Mm -hmm. um and so there's going to be a lot of that. Plus, we're going to get more into the Miskatonics and who they are. Cool. And, Very um, cool. That's 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 know, that's, that's those characters. That, that like I, I would like a little bit of that sort of like the who the detective agency he works for. Who are these guys? Um, when can we expect this book? Like, I mean, you, you're you're in you're in process right now. Um, like, when what, what what would be the con that we could go and be like sign my book? Oh, I see. Um, oh, for the for the next book that's the, for the yeah Wilcox for for Wilcox. That won't be out until probably next year. Okay. Um, the reason being is, is that when I, and I made a mistake when I wrote um, Reanimator because I we I told you we wrote shot as a screenplay and we converted it into a comic script, which are different. They're very right. different. Um, and so I thought I was being smart by writing a comic script first for Reanimator, then writing the screenplay, which I just finished two screenplays for that. And um, I, you know, after re, after going after writing the screenplays. I was so pissed off at myself because I was like, God damn it, I just came up with a bunch of cool shit that would have been great. Right. <laughs> you know? It's a different so, medium, yeah. Yeah, it's a different medium, but, you know, I didn't do it, I didn't play it that way. And when you're writing a screenplay, it, it just, things come out differently than they do when you're writing a comic because you're, you're, you know, with a comic, you're dealing with an eight and a half by 11 more or less page, uh-huh. you know, or panels. Whereas a screenplay, you're in a vast, you know, right. you know neighborhood. And I'm not saying that you're, you're stuck on those pages with a comic, but, because you, you, obviously you can draw whatever world you want on there, but, there is certain types of information that you try to keep streamlined for a comic where in a screenplay you can kind of draw it out a little bit more. Right. Um, but there was some character stuff, um, you know, because I introduced two Miskatonic characters um, in the screenplay that will be in the next book, um, Agent Candlestick and Agent Potter, who are, um, the Candlestick is six foot six and he's like 120 pounds. Oh, and cool. then Potter is like four foot 11 and he's 350 pounds. <laughs> so they're a very interesting duo that shows up in the, in the, in the screenplay. So I've, I don't know if I'm going to go back and add some stuff into a book and do a later release, you know, down the line. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it's a good combination of both at this point. And, and moving on with doing the next Wilcox book, I'm going to write as a screenplay first. <laughs> so, so I can add all that stuff in there, do it right. And then, um, Interesting. And I, so your yeah. So your process is 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 fascinating. You, you're going from writing screenplays, turning them into comics. Then you wrote a comic, and then you're then you wrote the screenplay. Out, and now you're going back to screenplays to turn it into a comic again. Yeah, that's I think the best way to go for me. That's fantastic. <laughs> you know, I love I love I love the world building in in your uh, in your writing. And I just I wanted I, I know we're we're getting close to time here, but I just wanted to just give you praise on on just the, the wonderful little details that you put in. Specifically, with the Curious Case of Reanimator on page sixty-nine, you talk about Wes and Ward, and I'm assuming they're old college roommates at Arkham University, and they talk about their house being burnt down on on Meadow Hill and the specimen. Yeah. And so, I feel you could, there's so many little details like that on the pages of these comics that you could go back and take any one of those details and write a whole comic out of it. Well, yeah, because what I basically what I had done was is I don't know if you guys have ever read the original uh, Reanimator story by HP. Uh-uh. But, no, not at all. Um, <clears throat> He was he was not a fan of it himself, but it, I, I love that story because it's there's a lot of great stuff in it. And so what I decided to do when I wrote this particular story is I wanted him. I'm a I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan. Me too. And and I love the character of um, Holmes and his arch nemesis Moriarty. Sure. And and I always love how Moriarty just kind of ha- uh, taunts and kind of screws with Sherlock Holmes every once in a while. So I needed that kind of foil with my character Lovecraft. So I figured, well, 
reanimator is like the perfect, the perfect yeah. foil, you know. Mm. And so in the original story that HP wrote, there's a, a character called the narrator. You never know his name, but he tells the story of reanimator, and he's his assistant. And so um, and in the original story, they start off at school, go to college, and then they, they go to war. And there's all sorts of different things. They, there's different aspects of their lives that they kind of keep meeting with each other and bumping into each other while Wes is still doing these experiments. So for, for the Curious Case Rain Minute that I wrote, I wanted to have that base plate. Mm. And so what I did was is I had, for me anyways, because uh, uh, Lovecraft only went to high school until I think his junior year. And then he had a nervous breakdown and never came back. It's fucking high school. I would have. Had, I had several. <laughs> I'm still having I'm breakdowns. Still, I'm still <laughs> have coping from that shit. It's high school. I get it. So he, um, and, and also, like in, you know, in the book, you'll notice that he, his nickname, the uh, Flannery, there calls him Lovey. Right. The nickname that Lovecraft was given in high school, and he hated that nickname. <laughs> so it was one of those things. That's like, so you're right. There's a lot of those little tidbits in there, but with particularly their relationship, I wanted to make it so that. They had met each other at school and in high school, became, you know, lab partners or whatever. They're both into science. They went to college. Um, they fucked up, and they, they were given an option by the school because they had, they managed to kill one of their teachers. Oops. And was, yeah, <laughs> As you like, do. As you do. <laughs> it, happens, it happens in the book. It was, it was, their main, it was the, one of the professors. And so they're like, well, you can either go to jail or you, go to, or you get sent to war. So they both go to war. Herbert goes into the uh, medic. Lovecraft's tired of his shit. He's like, I'm done with you. So he goes into artillery. And then um, I created this, uh, what they talk about on one of the pages there when they first meet each other. He says, oh, my childhood good padre and, and delin- or my ch- uh, delinquent childhood good, co- childhood good padre. Um, and, you know, my lab assistant or what he says. And then he talks about how uh, St. George's Day, which was a famous battle during World War One, And so what ended up happening in my version is that West basically reanimated a bunch of German and uh, uh, U.S. soldiers to kind of cover his escape because he was just done with dealing with the, you know, uh, you know, yeah. being in the army, and he basically took off and went for the other line. Which so is basically he he sent all these undead troops after Lovecraft and his guys. So that's why Lovecraft's kind of pissed off at this point when they meet up again. Yeah, which is okay. re- which is really dope when the Nazis show up and Himmler's like. Well, uh, I, I don't know. I, I really like that Nazi bent that kind of like permeates this book because it, it does kind of remind me a lot of Indiana Jones. It has like, yeah, because I mean, every one of those, every single one of those movies, he's fighting Nazis. But it doesn't feel derivative either. It, does, it feels yeah, like know, it's right. original it, it, thing. It feels like, like, it doesn't feel like Chris Pratt in Jurassic World. <laughs> you know what I mean? If Like Lovecraft feels like his own character. <laughs> right, right. Not like just, right. yeah. So. Himmler, if you read about Himmler in history, he was he was really into the occult. Occult, I mean, yeah, bad, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a bad dude, you know. And I was like, well, shit. I mean, they got all this money, they got all this stuff, and, and my universe is kind of an alternate universe, anyway. It's not one hundred percent our world. Obviously. Right, 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 right. So I figured, well, screw it. I mean, you know, I like Steve Punk, Diesel Punk, all that stuff. So why not these guys? If these guys had been working with West for ten years or, or more, why not? You know, why wouldn't they have these cool gadgets and gears and stuff like that? They know about you know, grimoires and magic and all that crap. So why not make them cosmic monster hunters? And that's what they're doing is basically, you know, this is before World War II, obviously. So, you know, you know, for, for us, it's not really, for us, we had Auschwitz for them. It's like they they round up monsters Mm -hmm. and what they do is they do experiments on monsters. So it's kind of an opposite of what our world has here. Um, That in their reality, they're monster collectors and that's what they do. You know? So I think, that kind of lends itself into its own way because, you know, Himmler wants Cthulhu for his own purposes and West wants him for his own purposes. Both not good, but, right. you know, it's like what lesser of two evils does Lovecraft have to deal with? You right. Know, right. So. Well, shit, man. Dude, this is this was really cool, man. Thanks for doing this for us. Uh, we could do this for hours. I mean, honestly, we really could. <laughs> okay. Like, I, uh, I'm just glad you we got we found the time to sort of, like, highlight your work and highlight your process and, and sort of like the good work that, that, you know, people in our circle are doing, especially towards what, what we as fans of these types of genres are into, you know what I'm saying? And we'll definitely get you back next year as well. When, uh, when, yeah, the, when the, the book, comes, book comes, out. comes out, yeah, keep us informed, man. Like, uh, uh, I think, I think there's a start of a great relationship here, Dave. <laughs> no, oh, oh, although, be- 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 hey, Dave, before I, before I let you go, I want to, I want to ask you about this memory that I have, it, I think it was like one of the first times I met you. It was uh, it was my birthday, and your brother had lent me his truck to go out drinking. 
Okay. And then Oops. I promptly, promptly. <laughs> Wait, how does that work? He lends you a truck to go drink. Well, because because he, he was he had to work the next day and it was my birthday and he was like, well, I'm not gonna go with you. And I was like, well, you gonna let me drink by myself? Which he did, which he did. <laughs> and so I, I promptly went. I, I was out in OB and I promptly lost his truck. Uh, and then, uh, uh, do you remember this story? Yeah. And I, I, I thought someone had, st- I, I got so drunk on my birthday that I thought someone had stolen the truck from where I had parked it. And so I, I, I basically just gave up, called him and was like sitting on the curb waiting for you guys to pick me up at, uh, to file a police report. Cut to, motherfucker, you guys showed up in town and found this truck exactly where I had parked it. <laughs> do you remember this story? <laughs> Because he, he called you to pick him up to come pick me up and found this truck. I, uh, but see, uh, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's the thing with my brother. He's, he's, he should not have any type of uh, motorized vehicle. <laughs> 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 or even his own purpose. But definitely, definitely, dude. Hey, um, hey. Yeah, before I go, hey, I want to let you guys know, too, is that we're doing a, um, I'm working with a group of guys, uh, two guys, uh, they created a, uh, you can check them out on Kickstarter right now. I think they have their um, campaign still going. They're called Miskatonic High. Okay. Okay. And it's kind of like Archie meets Lovecraft, so to speak. I mean, it's um, it, it's it's a group of these um, kids that are in high school or prep school, and they deal with Lovecraftian type of situations. Uh-huh. And I had so much fun reading their stuff um, when they started doing it a little while ago that I, um, I'm working on a uh, crossover with them right now. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so they, they're... They just sent me the, the script for the for the book that they're going to write first, the floppy, mm-hmm. and um, I'm actually working on the floppy for part two, and um, so we're going to have that. We're hoping to have that both those out before the end of the year. Awesome. Um, so there'll, there'll be crossovers for that, and then I'm writing um, uh, like Penny Dreadful uh, style uh, uh, works, you know, with some artwork in it, but it's primarily going to tell the story. That it's called the Chronicles. The Re- I think it's called the Chronicles of Reanimator. And it's basically just the starting of, um, uh, you know, that, that character, uh, uh, Herbert West, you know, uh, for where he first meets Lovecraft in high school. So I'm going to do that stories, you know, those stories in that kind of format. So you kind of get that more, that, that much more of a history um, with the universe that we're building. Awesome. And we'll, we'll put all these links in, in yeah. the, uh, the podcast, uh, you know, below the podcast and all that. So you can find all this information. You can go to darksidemedia.us and find all the books there for sale. There's digital versions. There's physical copies. There's T-shirts. There's, there's, there's You guys have really done a great job merchandising yeah, everything the merch, as well. The merch stuff is really cool. Like the, like the bust, the different kind of bust and stuff like that. That's really cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're trying to do, you know, in every show I do um, – I always try to look at the merchandise around me, and always I always change the merchandise as much as I can too to see what sells better than others. Sure. So. I have a cousin actually. He he's he's worked with Zero Friends. He does the kind of like comic book circuit out in California for a while. Dave Cree Art. He does a lot of the same similar things. And you know, I'm proud of him. And I think yeah. you, what you guys are doing is great as well. It's really just it's wonderful to see that you guys you know you you have an, a vision of the art thing that you want to create, and no matter what, you do it. Yeah. Rob and I yeah. try to do the same exact yeah, thing. It's, it's yeah, it's the the struggle is real on all accounts, and it's just good to see cats who who are going for it and taking chances and saying fuck it, let's just get it up, you know. Yeah, definitely, man, definitely, I and mean, that's why we you know we decided to go with Lovecraft first in our in our series and in Berserkers as a second because at least Lovecraft has a name value that we can try to get out there. Of course, there, right? You, you know, it's a good idea, but it's kind of a tougher. You know, it doesn't have name recognition, and that's obviously what everybody kind of goes for now, more right. than ever. Right. Right. You know? That's your foot in the so, door, for sure. Well, now Lovecraft, I mean, over the last five years, it's just gone. Yeah, the, like the proliferation of, 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 of IPs that like are taking this Lovecraftian bent and like running with it. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some studio comes knocking at your door eventually for some of this work, man. So uh, from us to you, keep going, and uh, thanks, man. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. We'll get you back, Dave. Thanks so much, bud. Will do. Have a good one. You too. Peace. That was uh, Dave W. Kahn. Uh, this has been fantastic. What we into? What we into? Comic uh, book review. Comic book review. Hey, thanks, cousin Dave. Thanks for the shout out to that boy, uh, Chris Can uh, and the Can family. I love you, boys. Peace. <laughs>